All right. Good morning and good afternoon to those of you um, in um, Eastern time zones and, and beyond. Uh, welcome to um, our open webinar today on open and free MOOCs with the Open Education Consortium. Um, and I'm very pleased to have uh, two um, MOOC developers and experts here with me this morning, Hei Jung Chung from Tufts University and Matthew Bloom from Scottsdale Community College. And I'm Una Daly um, and I'm the um, College Outreach Director and the Curriculum Design uh, Director for the Open Education Consortium. All right. Uh, for those of you who uh, might be new to the Collaborate system, uh, we are using Blackboard Collaborate this morning and we thank the California Community College system uh, for um, access to their system. Um, and um, you will see a participants list on the left hand side and uh, you should see your name there. And directly underneath that you'll see a chat window and um, we can take Q questions uh, throughout the webinar uh, down there in the chat window. Um, and we'll open it up um, in between presentations for uh, uh, questions that you can um, actually use your microphone for. And I, I, I want to welcome everyone to Open Education Week. Uh, this webinar is offered as part of the celebration of this week. And it's all about raising awareness about free and open educational opportunities that um, exist uh, throughout the world. Um, and people um, approach open education from a number of perspectives. Uh, this morning, of course, we're going to be hearing from a faculty member and an instructional designer. So um, very much from um, a uh, support for existing uh, studies and for teaching resources. But many people uh, throughout the world use um, open education for developing new skills for work or um, for just learning something new for their personal interest. So really glad you could all join us this morning. And um, we want to ask you now where you're from. Um, and you can use the toolbar that's in the middle of the um, screen uh, to grab a little icon. Uh, if you go over to the one that looks kind of like a star, you can grab one of those and, and drop it uh, where you're located and show us um, if you're from North America or um, maybe beyond North America, which is it's always exciting when we get folks uh, from um, outside of uh, the United States and North America. Um, or you can type in the chat window and let us know where you're from as well. Looks like um, our live attendees here are, uh, we've got some East Coast folks and um, some West Coast folks. Oh, and wonderful. And we've got uh, Celine um, says that she is from France. Um, exciting. Welcome, welcome Celine. And, and Ramon is from North America. Great. And we also have Nicole White. Welcome, uh, welcome Nicole. Great to see you. And she's in East Tennessee, which is uh, also in the United States. All right. Now I just want to give you a chance to meet our presenters um, before we get started. And um, I'm going to start with Hei Zhong, um, who is an instructional designer at Tufts University. Hello everyone. I am a, a faculty consultant on uh, teaching strategy with technology here. Wonderful. Thank you, Heijun. And uh, Matthew. Um, Matthew is uh, English faculty at Scottsdale Community College. And um, please uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, Matthew. Uh, hi. Yeah. Um, well, I'm yes, yeah, Scottsdale Community College. I teach English 101 and 102, and I've been working with open educational resources now for about three years or so and have had some pretty cool experiences. Wonderful. And um, if you haven't had a chance to introduce yourself in the chat window, um, participants, uh, please, please let us know um, where you're from and what your interest is in OER. Um, if you're with a, a educational institution, uh, let us know that. Or if you're using um, OER for your own personal um, enhancement, that's great to know as well. 
So this morning um, I'm going to give you a really quick overview on um, the Open Education Consortium and the Community College um, Consortium which is a member of the um, Open Education Consortium. And um, then we're pretty much going to go into our presentations from our two speakers. And then there will be time for um, additional Q&A at the end. So as I said, you know, please uh, do, do let us know if you've got questions. Uh, just go ahead and type those in the chat window as we go along. So the Open Education Consortium um, is the largest uh, global organization dedicated uh, to open, open education and spreading um, knowledge globally. Um, we started out uh, way back over a decade ago uh, with MIT. Um, who put their open course put their coursework online, and since that time we've grown to be in over 40 countries and 280 plus um, organizations and institutions worldwide, and over 30,000 courses have been um, posted um, online, um, and they've been translated into 29 languages. So um, this is a movement that started over a decade ago over a decade ago and has just been picking up momentum. Um, Tufts University, um, He Zheng uh, is from, um, they are a sustaining member of the Open Education Consortium and have been working on OER for many years now as well. And you're going to hear about one of their exciting MOOCs in a moment. Uh, the Community College Consortium, we are an associate consortium of the Open Ed Education Consortium and our mission is expanding access to high quality materials, uh, supporting faculty choice and development um, for curriculum, and improving student success. And um, the Community College Consortium, which is a member of OEC, uh, represents over 250 colleges in 19 states and provinces throughout North America. And um, Matthew, who is speaking with us uh, in a, a little bit later on, is from Scottsdale Community College, which is part of the Maricopa Community College District in Arizona. It's the largest district, uh, co community college district in um, the United States with 10 colleges and over 250,000 students. So uh, before I turn it over to my speakers, I just wanted to go over just a couple basic definitions. So we, we throw around the term MOOC. Um, and of course that stands for Massive Open Online Course. Um, and, but today we're talking to you about MOOCs that are openly licensed. All of the content is available for reuse, remix, and redistribution. This is not true of all uh, MOOCs. Um, all MOOCs are open enrollment um, at this point, uh, but the content um, in some cases is licensed simply for the user who has enrolled in it. Um, and so as part of our mission here at the Open Education Consortium, we want to make the content available to be freely reused. And uh, both Heishung and Matthew are going to talk to you about their OER-based MOOCs. Um, a couple of options that um, some of the OER based MOOCs offer is certificates are available for a modest fee. So this is for um, folks who take the course and they want to actually um, use it perhaps in a career situation and so they would like a certificate that shows that they took the course, the MOOC, and that they uh, passed it. Um, some of the MOOCs are self-paced and some are moderated. Heijung's is a moderated course that she'll talk about. Uh, Matthew will be talking about a self-paced uh, MOOC. And instructional design elements and the assessment that goes on will vary from MOOC to MOOC. Sometimes there's peer assessment. Sometimes it's uh, you know, simply uh, um, multiple choice tests or it can even be discussion boards. So there's a lot of variation and uh, you're going to get to hear about two really um, special examples of MOOCs here this morning. And I'm going to turn it over now to Heijung Chung to talk about the biology of water and health MOOC developed at Tufts University. Una, well, thank you so much. Um, here uh, in this session I would like to share with you my personal reflection on uh, our main outcome of our university's first experience offering a MOOC. The main outcome was a high retention rate. And from an instructional design point of view, 
uh, I'll share some of the factors that I personally believe that that uh, helped create an engaging look for us. Okay, thank you. Next slide. So uh, uh, Luna gave you a little bit of background about Tufts University. And we were the founding member, one of the founding members with OCW. And with uh, now OEC has a partnership, built a partnership with edX. <clears throat> we were able to, a little slow uh, transitioning the slide here. So OEC built a partnership with uh, edX. Uh, and so with that partnership, Tufts University was able to offer a course called the Biology of Water and Health last fall semester. And we offered um, traditional edX certificates of completion. So honor code means uh, those who complete the coursework will get the certificate. And verified certificate is uh, you pay for minimum fee and you get to um, verify your student ID. So um, if you go to Google um, and search and to search edX and TOF and biology, you'll see this page coming up. And uh, as Una said, all of our content is Creative Commons license. So currently, um, this course is an archive course, uh, but you can uh, um, go there and access all the materials that developed in that course. On the right-hand side, um, again, through this OEC partnership, our school representative on edX is not tough, OEC, OEC X. So the, one of the many reasons that I think uh, the course, this course particularly uh, was chosen is because this course was offered once uh, eight years ago on our OCW website. So our assumption was that our professors who went through this um, OER process, making their materials, um, uh, life go through this licensing, or preparing for their material for OER, uh, was definitely helpful, um, um, but because the time passed by, the, the interactions that MOOC require is a little different than o OCW, so we had to develop uh, new materials for this particular project. <coughs> Let me go to the next slide. It's a little slow here. Um, so an example of a MOOC video, um, so because we were preparing for this material for OER, um, any evidence-based slides that, as you can see in the video, um, had to be drawn on a whiteboard and with, with a citation to go along with it. So um, we did this in, in almost three months period for the production. So let me get right into our outcome, and let me share your, my reflection. So our tough move ended with a high retention rate. Um, this is a snapshot of our project summary deck that my director put together. Uh, you have to read all the text there, um, but as in the middle, I highlighted with a yellow, uh, no, <laughs> red color. 64% of about 4,000 people who actually uh, accessed the first week course. The first week is the most popular course. And the 64 of our active students who stay throughout the course. And as you see at the bottom, the red line at the bottom uh, indicates that 15% of our enrollees were trying for full credit, full credit problems um, throughout the course. Another data point here, advancing the slide here, that 13% um, of our uh, students, again, earned a certificate. And going back to the first week, the most popular week, those who, 30 percent of them who visited the first week's content uh, complete the course. So if compared to other, other courses, um, this is a um, substantial number. So I went ahead and reflected uh, on uh, why uh, we were able to retain that many people. And my personal conclusion is that um, we were able to offer um, what tough is university stands for uh, that um, sharing the tough experience online. So uh, this is a statement from our a strategic plan coming up. <laughs> it's a um, Tufts University wants to be at offering global perspectives for learners, transformational experiences, 
and active citizenship. And I think when you think about our first talk MOOC, um, it really uh, it was able to bring out all these aspects. So let me go into a little bit of what uh, my reflection on that part. So the first of all, uh, the course really represented talks really well, and it was the right fit for the global audience. So if you see the image that's coming up, you see the professor, a uh, good um, professor Je uh, Jeff Griffith, who were really um, bringing this uh, global issue of water um, that affects everyone. Um, but also you went uh, really they went through the fundamentals of the content, the so water related diseases and how people study them. And and we treated this course because it's our first time, we treated this course as a pilot. So we didn't do a massive marketing um, to promote this course. But uh, the professors were really able to help to get the word out through their professional network. So my assumption is that uh, many of our students signed up for this course because they already had an interest. Um, and they probably may be working in their field. Uh, the second uh, thought is uh, you will be, when you produce a, a course uh, in MOOC, uh, as a MOOC format, uh, your videos will be really short. And those who work in the online learning world, um, it's called segmenting and chunking. The chunking the content in a smaller segment helps you digest, digest content better. Uh, but not only that, I think that um, this 13 week long traditional course uh, works out well with uh, dividing them up into parts. So what we offered last uh, November was part one, uh, which covers the fundamental knowledge of that particular topic. And we offer only a four week long course. And not only we shortened the course length, but we had the professors had to pick and choose what's appropriate for the MOOC, or the content-wise. So 69 percent of content is chosen. So uh, I think people have to assume uh, we have to assume that um, the, we are actually creating a new course for a new audience, not uh, bring our existing material that was designed for our residential course. And I'll go into my third uh, point here uh, from an instructional designer. Um, the little things that really help uh, the course really engaging. Um, if you work with a MOOC uh, platform, it's designed for a scale. So um, it's hard to reach everyone because there's so many people. And it's hard to assess everyone's uh, real understanding of content. So uh, only machine-graded assessments will give you some sense of what people are doing in the course. But within that parameter and the limitation, you can still think about ways to uh, bring in the engagement into your design process. So um, as you design the lecture content, um, there is some traditional lecture content. But as you can see in this picture, that's coming up. <laughs> um, uh, we introduced a weekly introduction like this in a format uh, of a conversation, not uh, one person looking into the camera talking here. It really brings this uh, conversation between the two experts in the field and have them talk about why this week's content is really important in the real world. So really providing the interdisciplinary connection there and also theory into practice. Um, another element of engagement part here is that, um, uh, the, uh, again, the water issue is global. So we, the professors wanted to, the students to share their own source of water, uh, send us a photo. And, uh, and I think that made class really feel small. Uh, I, I believe that hundreds of photos were submitted around the globe, like this, as you can see in this image. And, and, and people, this was not a graded assignment, but people really went ahead and, and wanted to share the photo sources. So I, I think this worked out really well. Uh, the last piece with interactive techniques on MOOC is um, the live streaming event that we did. So 
um, we thought a lot about how can we uh, try to, as much as possible, reach um, many, many students in this course, take advantage of them. Uh, so we offer three live streaming events. The uh, edX platform didn't come with particular technology, but they allow us to wireframe. Um, what I mean by that is bring in other technology into the course. So uh, our media group, who always does this live streaming, web streaming for commencement, they were prepared for that at that scale. It started to many, many users. So um, and, uh, as you can see, at the first event, we had over um, 350 students. Uh, that's uh, pretty impressive if you think of all the time zone uh, differences. Um, but uh, we had a very exciting discussion. And our student evaluation says that this is the uh, most unique experience that they had um, compared to other work. So uh, my talk is almost uh, there. So I talked about uh, the main outcome being really high retention rates. And, and my reflection dealt with the three uh, points. So the course was really uh, designed for the global audience, course set for the right fit. And then course was again segmented. So it, it, it's digestible for many students who may not be ready to commit so much of their time. And a course that uses try to uh, use as much of interactive technique as possible. So with that, I'd like to uh, conclude my portion of the talk. Um, so do, Una, do you want me to turn it over to you or take some questions at the moment? Um, we can certainly take some questions. Um, thank you, Heijun. Um And I want to, um, if you didn't catch the link I posted in there earlier, here is the link to um, the course, the Biology of Water and Health MOOC on edX platform. And um, Heijun has just given you kind of a glimpse at the MOOC. Um, it has amazing resources and videos, um, as she mentioned, which is, I think, why they, they um, did get such good student engagement. And um, we'd be happy to take some questions uh, now if people would like to ask Heijun about some of that development work and, and, um, and, and uh, more about the student learning outcomes. Um, and, the, and you can grab the microphone by clicking on the talk button. Um, if you would like to uh, ask a question. Um, hey, Jung, I had a question for you. Um, in terms of, and I, I don't know if you have these numbers with you right now, but in terms of um, learners, um, you had a total enrollment number, right? Did, yes. did you have a breakdown by um, continent, um, so where most of your students came from? Um, I, I don't have the exact number right now. Uh, we were able to reach students from 153 countries, uh, but the, I think 20 or 30 percent-ish was a U.S. student. So you said there was students from 150 countries, but a large concentration was large from the U.S.? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, great. There was a question from Ramon here, and he said, how was the peer review experience in the edX course? Um, um, so uh, the photo assignment that you saw, the example, the snapshot is from the discussion forum. Um, originally, we wanted to carry that assignment with the peer assessment piece. And, and at the moment, um, the, that was the only photo sharing option for us. So we designed some, some activities that fit that assignment as peer assessment tool. I have to say it's still in a very early stage of development, and um, so we didn't feel confident enough about the, you know, the peer assessment is a machine gradable assessment which comes with a rubric, but um, we tried to be, you know, plan B was to have the discussion forum too. By the time that we launched the course, uh, we do use the discussion forum uh, which just had it, uh, that photo sharing, uploading option just launched uh, by the time that we launched the course. So 
So we, as a plan B, we did the discussion forum. And it turned out that uh, there were some issues with the peer assessment. I know ADES is making a lot of improvements at the moment. Um, but I think without the discussion board uh, for that photo sharing assignment, it would be really hard. Okay. Uh, th yeah, thank you. Uh, and um, Ramon, did you, you, you can, okay, he said thanks, so I, that covered it. So it sounds like peer assessment might be something that you might explore further in part right. two. Yeah. Okay. You traditionally, this this course, yeah. traditionally, this course, the major assignment is a final research paper. So we tried, <laughs> we, we didn't aim for it because there was no such tool available for that MOOC scale. Um, yeah, but there were some technical issues as well. And okay. so they're working on it. Yeah, at edX, at, at, at X, which yeah. edX was the platform that you used. Yeah, thank you yeah. for that. Um, hey, Jung, you had a question here from, uh, let's see, from Bo. Bo asked if you could talk a little bit more about how instructional designers get involved in, in course design, in this course design. Um, in this course design, um, I was a course designer, but also um, managed uh, the production team. And so, um, but I try to minim. So I was the one who actually produced with my, many of my team members produced the course along with making decisions for the instruction design. I try to involve um, professors in many decision making. But because just delivering the content, the filming, and the filming itself takes a lot of their time. So I made sure that we, we agreed on digestible content first, and then kind of backward design, trying to come up with um, what was the right level of learning objectives and, and goals. So um, the content was captured first to, to mind their time. And then we re-evaluated the system in the meantime. We wrote the learning objectives. And, and have probably met another time to decide on the assignment uh, and the student interaction, uh, what kind of activities that they want to do. Uh, so uh, in the meantime, I, I, I studied the platform a lot, so what's possible or not. And so probably after video capture, um, three meetings maybe, yeah. That so I I was managing the content and and design and and production kind of in the parallel thing. I don't know if I answered the question. Uh, and Bo says thanks, and I think that yeah, you you gave a very complete uh, analysis of that. Um, hey Jung, thank you. I think we have time for one last question, and I think you've touched on it before, but Celine has asked. Can you tell us more about how you modularize the course? And I think you were addressing this um, in your last question, but if, if you want to touch back on that at all, Heijung? Yes. Yeah, we were such in a time period, uh, three month time period. So um, in such case, it was, it, we, we try to start from the existing syllabus and try to divide it up the uh, week. But um, we just, started offering a short, shortening the course because of the project timeline that we had. So um, there was no like solid rationale for making four weeks versus over six weeks. But uh, the four weeks of content in the syllabus was real and a good set of foundational knowledge. And the later part, they talked about issues and making interventions and so on. So, so just uh, trying to see the topics covered in the syllabus and what it makes sense to be doing that. Okay, thank you. And, and so the four weeks of content in the MOOC was extrapolated from an original 13-week course, right? Right, right. But it, the copy test makes, makes sense to be standalone. It sounds like saying so it's not like contingent on, on each other. So. Well, great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Hei Zhang. And we'll have some time at the end to that you can we can get back with Hei Zhang um, and have further questions for her. Um, in the meanwhile, we're going to move on to uh, Matthew Bloom, who is a English faculty, teaches online and hybrid at Scottsdale Community College, and he's going to take us out here um, to show you his MOOC that he developed on the Canvas platform. 
Matthew? Matthew, oh, no, I'm, we're I'm not really able to hear that. you, so you may over. need to click um, your Yeah, so um, thanks for giving the opportunity to talk about this. This um, has been kind of evolving a little bit over the last couple of years. Uh, I want to start by saying this is a very different kind of MOOC because this is, rather than the previous one and most MOOCs which are designed for students, uh, this is actually an open resource MOOC designed for faculty. Uh, it's the, the idea was to get, or initially to get composition and rhetoric faculty interested in using open educational resources, creating, modifying ones that they find online. Um, but it has since then developed into um, a course that really is app applicable for anyone who's interested in learning a little bit about the basics of the open, um, well, the open culture movement, the open resource movement specifically, uh, as well as the basics of licensing, um, how to find materials, how to adapt and, and license your own. It all started um, in 2012, I'd say, when I was um, in one of my first couple of years teaching full time at Scottsdale Community College, I was really interested in finding more information about what kinds of resources there were for my students because I wanted to, you know, I didn't like the idea of having them purchase a textbook that I wasn't going to use completely and all that. And as I started to seek out information about um, open resources that would be relevant to English composition, I found that, con I mean, you know, uh, in comparison to the resources that are out there for, you know, mathematics and a lot of the sciences and things like that, there was relatively little in the field of English composition. Um, and there are some, there's a lot more now in the last couple of years, a lot have been developed, but uh, especially at the time, it was my interest to, um, to kind of talk a little bit, of, like address that, like why is it that, that uh, composition faculty uh, haven't been creating it? And, and there are reasons for it, and, and one, of the, one of the main things that this MOOC was addressing was, um, you know, English being a very kind of subjective discipline, you need a lot of, uh, you know, original sources that you might be analyzing and things like that, and so it's kind of hard to navigate the copyright um, and, and find materials that you can actually incorporate, you know, even in, in terms of just having units that are meaningful for students. Um, so that's kind of where it started. So what I did was I, um, I uh, applied to get funding from uh, the Maricopa Community, uh, County Community College District in, in the summer of 2013, and they uh, agreed to fund this project. And so what I did was I spent the summer uh, you know, researching open resources and basically putting together uh, this kind of do-it-yourself um, open course. Now this is, a, it's a work at your own pace, it's do it yourself, there's, it's, you know, there are some activities and I may have an opportunity to show you some. I, I don't want to show you too many pages of it because um, every time I move the, the website around it reloads it on your screen. So, but uh, the link is made available to you and I encourage you to check it out maybe afterwards um, or even right now if you want to listen while I'm talking. Um, but so they, they funded it and, um, you know, it was a great experience for me just learning about all these different things, but basically what I was able to come up with was uh, a series of modules for uh, instructors. There's three modules, um, well, after a tutorial kind of like explanation of what you're doing. But the first module is just kind of addressing what open educational resources are because as you probably know if you're working with those and working with faculty or people who are interested, a lot of times people don't really have um, a real clear understanding of what actually an open educational resource is um, because, you know, there are a lot of different things that you can access for free online that are not by definition OER because they're not licensed, you know, for that, uh, that sharing. And so um, what I did was I kind of went through, uh, you know, the, the basics of, you know, understanding where the open culture movement comes from and how, you know, when that merged with education, with the idea of wanting to share materials digitally, um, and at basically the birth of the, of the OER movement uh, in this first module here. And there is an assessment at the end. Um, there are, uh, there's usually in the modules there's some sort of uh, beginning assessment to see where people are in terms of their their standing knowledge of, of whatever we're talking about. And then throughout, sometimes there are some kind of formative assessments just to see like little practice quizzes that are just automatically graded. This course um, works on its own. I, you know, I, I created it like that on purpose because there was no 
um, you know, there's not necessarily going to be continuing funding for anyone to sit there and, and try to grade things or whatever. So it really is just an open, in itself, like just an open-ended course that anyone can take, literally anyone, because this is in Canvas, which is, um, uh, this is the open, free Canvas site. Anyone can just get a free login uh, and, and use this course, access it whenever they want. Uh, currently, on the free Canvas site, there are only there's no more than ten. I forgot the exact number, but there's there's only a few people um, from you know around the country who are using it. Uh, but on the Maricopa Canvas, which is our uh, which is our district's learning management system, I have about forty different faculty and administrative uh, and administration members that uh, have accessed it. Uh, at least once, and a lot of people have been accessing it regularly. And by regularly, I mean like once every couple of months, uh, because people who are interested in, um, you know, learning about open resources or incorporating them into their courses have found this to not necessarily be the kind of course you're going to sit down and do all at once, but that is there for you whenever you want to access it. So it can function either way. It takes about three hours all from beginning to end to do the whole thing. Um, and certainly, I don't expect any student to sit there and, and actually do that, or any faculty member to do that. Usually, it's kind of a piecemeal thing they'll go through, and they'll use it as a, as a resource to answer specific questions. Um, one thing that did happen last fall was our, the, the district approached me about, because I, uh, a year ago, I should say first, um, in the spring, um, I actually conducted a face-to-face -face session in our district, um, basically introducing um, about 15, 20 faculty members to this workshop and how they can use it. So it was like a three-hour face-to-face workshop that set people up to use this one. and. Uh, and that was a really great experience, and the district wanted to continue doing that. And the thing is, is that even though this was initially designed with the idea that it was going to be for composition and rhetoric faculty, um, it was clear when I was finished with it that other than some, other than the fact that all of my examples were composition examples, uh, everything in here is applicable to any field. And so uh, they approached me, gave me a little bit more funding to go through and kind of update it a little bit and change it so that it would appeal to the general audience. And so that's what we have now. Um, it's not just uh, focused on composition and rhetoric. It really applies to any field, any discipline. Um, and so, like I said, this first part here is about defining open educational resources. Uh, the second module here has to do with the legal aspect, the licensing. Um, there's a little bit about copyright guidelines in here, which is a very uncomfortable thing. If you, I, I don't know what your experiences are exactly, but I do know that um, you get a wide range of reactions when you start to bring up copyright issues with faculty, and sometimes it's, you get like yelled at, you know, um, or people get really uncomfortable because they uh, sometimes feel like they're being, you know, threatened or there's, there's somebody's telling them that they're doing their breaking the law, which they might be, um, and of course that makes them uncomfortable. So what this does is it kind of tries to navigate that um, using humor, using um, I think pretty good examples and some pretty clear um, explanations. I am greatly indebted to a number of resources that are online, of course. Wiki Educator um, at the time was a really great resource for a lot of um, applicable information. Of course, the Creative Commons website um, is, is um, you know, thoroughly uh, cited and linked throughout this whole thing. So it's, you know, it's by no means the only resource online for this, but it is, it is kind of a nice um, place where you can find some of this information. And like I said, it is. It, there are some interact, uh, interactive elements to it throughout, like these little Q in the circle there. If you're not familiar with Canvas, that means it's like a quiz. Um, and you know, I can give you um, an example of one of them here. Uh, if you this here, um, let's get this set up here. Basically, this right here just gives you the opportunity to go through and test uh, the knowledge that you have, you know, the, the information, your knowledge of the information that you've covered in the module. So it's, it, it, there are some of these assessments built into it. This one, for example, gives you uh, different scenarios and then asks you to determine whether or not you think it would be an acceptable uh, use of a Creative Commons license to work based on, you know, the, uh, the, the situation. So um, let's see, yeah, the third module then, I'm going to have to get, it always warns you in Canvas, making sure that you actually do want to leave the quiz. The third module here, and this is the last time I'll move the screen, so I apologize for um, the loading 
but this right here focuses on um, the actual creation and adaption of uh, or adaptation of, uh, of existing materials. And so, um, you know, we you kind of like look and see where you can find materials and how to use found materials in the previous module. But this one actually goes into how to transform your existing materials, vetting them, you know, get ridding, get, get, get getting rid of content that you're not sure about, or trying to figure out ways to adapt. Uh, stuff that you've already created and make it OER. It also has a section um, about planning uh, a new resource if you're planning on developing new content from the beginning. So that way you're thinking about it because one of the most important things about developing OER content is um, being, and this is, um, uh, you know, this is I think a really important point, is like being very precise and, and, um, and having your Overall intentions in mind from the beginning, because if you start developing a resource and you're not, or a, you know, any kind of classroom material, and you don't have OER in mind from the beginning, then when you get to the end, you can't license it, and you might just have to do a lot of it over again. So I kind of wanted to um, let people know that you know you don't have to make this transition all at once. You don't have to overthink it. But if you are sitting down to create a new presentation for uh, a course that you're teaching or if you're sitting down to create a new activity or something, just keep in mind that if it's all your original content or if you go online and you use some, you know, like Google advanced search filters so that you only get the Creative Commons licensed pictures or whatever it might be, if you do some very simple steps like that, it makes it a lot easier to actually create a legitimate, a legitimate licensed resource that you can then share. Um, so that's, I guess that's pretty much everything that I have to say. All right. Um, thank you so much, uh, Matthew. I was <laughs> typing a few comments in because um, I thought uh, that last point you made was really important about if you have the objective of wanting to share these resources uh, with your colleagues and perhaps even more widely, um, paying attention to where you're pulling resources from um, makes a lot of sense uh, so that you can um, easily just distribute uh, materials later on. Um, so excellent idea. Let's see. Um, I'm going to take us back to the main window here. And um, so here's a little bit more information about uh, Matthew's MOOC, uh, which can generally be used by faculty um, to find out about OER or if you're a faculty trainer. Um, and I do a lot of faculty training. Um, you can use the content within uh, Matthew's MOOC uh, to uh, train faculty on how to find and understand um, openly licensed materials. And I plan to use some of your quizzes, Matthew. <laughs> they looked very engaging. Um, so for some can, I, can I add one thing? I, I actually forgot to mention this when I was talking about it, and this is it's relevant to what's on the screen right here. Two things. First of all, that link right there is a self-enrollment link, so you just click on that and it, it allows you to, to access the course. Anyone can do that. But um, I want to draw your attention to the license here, and it says copyright Matthew Bloom. And if you look at the course, um, it's it's a little bit it's it's this is this is an interesting legal issue because this was something that was funded by a grant from my district, and part of the grant funding, part of the, the like the the contract basically for the funding is that whatever the product is that's created is. Owner, it's owned by the district. So um, I actually don't own the copyright. I was the author of um, the material, uh, the primary author. I mean, obviously, I incorporated a lot of stuff, and there's a lot of cited and linked sections. But um, so I was the author of the material. But uh, and and when I created it, I had in mind, okay, I'm creating this thing. I'm incorporating Wiki Educator content, which is BYSA, and or which is that you know uh, attribution share like license. And then when I talked to the district, when I realized it was a kind of a learning moment in the process of learning about OER um, that I wanted to license it OER and I actually had to get their permission and they at first wanted me to license it in a different way and I had to um, <coughs> I had to explain to them that I couldn't because this is the this is the only way that I could license it. So it was a learning experience for myself and for the district as well because there was that extra legal step that we had to take into consideration. Yeah, thank you for explaining that, uh, Matthew. And um, it was a typo on my part uh, to put that Matthew was the copyright holder. Um, in cases where uh, you know MOOCs are developed by individuals um, without institutional support, that might very well have been correct. Um, so thanks for explaining that, Matthew. And sorry for the typo. 
Um, I think we're going to open this up to questions. It looks like uh, maybe Ramon. It looks like you've grabbed the microphone. Did Did you have a question you wanted to? Um, oh, it looks like we do. We do have a question here in the in the chat window from Ramon. But you can also speak on the microphone if you want, Ramon. Oh, you took that off. Okay. So there was a question there for you, Matthew. How do you like um, using well, Canvas? Well, uh, you know, without getting into too many details, um, I would say that Canvas has a as a if, if just with any learning management system, um, there are a lot of different options, and I personally think that the um, the fewer things you offer to your students, the more likely they are to do everything that you want them to do. So I usually minimize the uh, the number of um, functions that that I use. But there are a lot of different things, and you can the 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 way that it's visually laid out, um, as you can see in that course, you know there are the modules are there's a list of modules. That's the you know the, where the whole course is, I have turned off all of the other functions so that students, anyone who wants to, I do this with my online classes too. Students land in the modules page, and they pretty much don't leave that unless they're accessing one of the content pages in order in the module. So I do like that function. We haven't talked too much about the platforms here today. Hey Jung, of course, mentioned the edX platform and. Uh, they have a whole training program associated with becoming a partner um, at edX, and, and that's quite a quite an involved uh, process. Um, Canvas has a process as well, um, and I don't know, Matthew, if you wanted to speak to the instructional design support that Canvas offers. Uh, well, I mean, I I think that my experience is is a little bit different than um, than it would be if you were trying to use Canvas. Uh, to do a MOOC that would be for students because you know you would probably do a set. I mean, this is kind of designed to be for faculty so that they can assess themselves and so that they would take that responsibility upon themselves to do it. And of course, MOOCs kind of require that too, uh, in general. But um, so I, I think that what what is interesting about it is that uh, you can you you have a lot of options. You can make it completely automated if you want. So that you don't actually have to go in and grade anything. I mean, it, it can just do all that for you if you're, if you, you know, the questions that you have are objectively answerable. Um, but when it came to designing the course uh, or designing any course using Canvas, if you're going to be teaching a course online, um, again, like I said, there are a lot of different ways that you can involve, you know, group discussions and things like that that can happen uh, live. So if I wanted to, at some point, I could, um, you know, message all of the students who have self-enrolled and say, hey, you know, this week we're going to have a, a live forum. If you have any current questions about OER, I'll be on for this hour or this whatever. And then, you know, there there would be that ability too. I haven't done that yet, but it's something to to, to consider. Great. Um, we had a, a question here for you, um, Matthew, from Bo, and he said, "Could you talk more about how you would use this course?" Yeah, this is a great training? question. I um okay. So the re uh, the our, our district. Let me see if I get my words out. Um, our district has um has seen how valuable this tool is. After um, after I created it and I shared it with our vice president of academic affairs and um, the president of our college, and then shared it with our district's uh, open educational resources uh, working group, and they, they were the ones kind of um, uh, there's a you know working on uh, what is a very famous nationwide. Um, I don't know if you've heard of the Maricopa Millions project, but it, it involves like a number of different uh, colleges adapting uh, open educational resources um, to uh, promote, I mean, you know, to save students money and things like that. And um, they shared the, the MOOC with quite a few people who were involved in that to give them some access to information about open educational resources. But the district has also continued to um, have me uh, at each semester now, uh, since spring 2013, uh, 2014, um, every semester I have conducted at least one face-to-face -face faculty workshop, and it's kind of an initiation workshop. Um, I like to say I use, like to use that word because it's by no means you know a, a way for students at, or students actually faculty in three hours to get everything they need about OER, but it helps to uh, sit down with them. They're in front of a computer. You know, it's a classroom of, of faculty. Uh, they're all in front of computers. They all have this uh, workshop open in Canvas in front of them, and I kind of walk them through how the, uh, the workshop uh, functions and some of the basic 
basics and things like that. That way they understand what's all there and everyone tends to get quite a bit out of it. And this, this year actually I have two different workshops that are coming up in April in, um, you know, in our district. And I'm going to have approximately, I think there's 50 people right now that are signed up for it. And you know, um, as Una mentioned, you know, we have a huge district and a lot of faculty. And so if I can get you know, anywhere between 25 to 50 um, members, uh, faculty members, learning about OER each semester, then that's going to, I think, have a real transformative effect on, on how you know, we go about business in many ways. Great, yeah. Thank you for that, Matthew. Um, it looks like you've got another question here from Bo. Um, could we use your course material for our own faculty here? That's a great question. Well, I, yeah, that question is easily answerable because there's a Creative Commons license on this whole thing. So it's not only, yeah, it's, I mean, this is, this is not just a workshop about open educational resource. It is an open educational resource. So you can use it according to the license. I mean, you've got the link, and so um, I mean, it's not required. If you if you want to send, if you want to have your faculty just go straight to that Canvas, that free Canvas link, and do it, that's fine. Um, I think that one of the drawbacks to to doing it in Canvas, and this is in hindsight, I think that you know I would have liked to have done this in a way that was even more open, maybe using WordPress uh, to create a, a just a you know no login necessary kind of, of of course and Canvas lets that happen but I have to figure out that functionality through through my district um, but uh, but yeah you can use this uh, in any way according to the license and I encourage you to do so it'd be great to see uh, the public site populate uh, in, in a way that's similar to how our district site is, is. Great, great, and uh, yeah, good point, Bo. That our, your faculty needs more hands-on assistance, and not just a course. So a combination of both. So at this point, we have just a few minutes left, and I want to open this up to general questions. If anyone has questions for uh, additional questions for Hejung about the Tufts University MOOC, um, or any uh, additional questions for Matthew, uh, please. Uh, Please either take the microphone by clicking on the talk button or um, typing it in um, the chat window. Uh, we have just a few more minutes and um, uh, once again, uh, while we're waiting for those questions to come in, I want to say thank you to our presenters. Um, really appreciate Hei Jung telling us about the biology of water and health. And as she mentioned, um, that is going to be re-offered. Part one is going to be re-offered, I think, this spring, later on this spring. And part two of biology, oh, sorry, you go ahead, Heijun. Sorry, um, so part two will be offered in September. We delivered yes. part one last year. You're going to rerun part one, though, right? Um, not sure yet. Not sure yet, okay, okay. Um, so but the materials <laughs> one, the materials for part one are available in, in an archive up on edX, so you can go That's through right. them in a self-paced format now. Yeah. Great. And so, yeah, so stay tuned for part two in September. And uh, Ramon, you asked, uh, this presentation is being recorded, and we will make the recording available to the Open Education uh, to the Open Education Consortium and it will be posted on the Open Ed site. I will also tweet it out so if you are following me on Twitter, uh, you will get notification that way. And that is my Twitter handle. Well, now I, uh, while we are waiting for questions and um, I I any additional questions, I want to give um, Matthew or Hei Jung, um, a, a moment for a final comment. If you if you have a final comment you'd like to leave with um, our audience. I just have to say that the experience going through developing this MOOC uh, was fascinating. The faculty really uh, went through a change uh, in terms of thinking in those short video <laughs> segments. And, and they see already a value of um, such pedagogy into the residential course. So I think there's a, 
lack any anecdotal evidence that the, it, it is worth doing. Um, so we'll just continue to explore that. <laughs> well, thank you for that, Heijun. So she said that it was difficult. I think this is what I heard. You said that for faculty to think in those smaller chunks, and uh, yeah. since faculty are used to giving one-hour lectures and having to break those down into like 10 minutes or less. Um, and it sounds like they're actually bringing that back into their traditional courses as well because as we know, everyone is so busy these days and students have a short attention span. So <laughs> that's an interesting side effect. So we don't have any action plan for reuse of how this MOOC, the, how, how currently it stands will be reused. But the, the process that helps them think through that process, I think, was a very beneficial process. Okay. And I think that kind of addresses Celine's question about what's the main advice for people who want to create MOOCs and um, working with your faculty is an important component of that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And they were extremely thrilled uh, about um, their ability to reach that level of audience. So again, it's a global topic and we, we reach the global audience so make ha have faculty be really happy. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think faculty really appreciate being able to reach people in hundreds of countries around the world that mm -hmm. normally they wouldn't have that opportunity. All right, Matthew, any closing comments as we um, as we get I ready to end the webinar? I just say thanks for um, giving me the chance to talk about it. I think it's a helpful tool, so please feel free to use it. All right, so once again, um, thank you, um, Matthew and Hei Jung, for wonderful presentations this morning. And thank you to those of you who attended live. And uh, we hope that you'll invite your friends to watch the recording uh, when it's available shortly. Have a wonderful afternoon and uh, a wonderful rest of the Open Education Week. Thanks, Emma. Thank you.